All right. So, um, good morning, everybody. Um, and the um, first thing uh, I wanted to do is to thank the organization for inviting me to, uh, to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Francisco Veloso, and I share my time between Carnegie Mellon University and the uh, Institut Catholica here, uh, here, um, here in Lisbon. And not surprisingly, I'm affiliated and actually one of the directors of the Carnegie Mellon Portugal program, a collaborative endeavor between the several universities here in Portugal and, um, and Carnegie Mellon. And what I was uh, uh, challenged to talk a little bit about here was about a tech hub development strategy uh, for Portugal. And what I'll tell you is actually a story. It's not just any story. I think it's a very interesting story. It's an old story, but it's actually at the same time also very, very up to date. Because of the dis kinds of discussions that happen about how to develop a tech, a tech hub in a country like Portugal. So here's Portugal. Oh, okay. Here's Portugal. Uh, we know it well. And the question we have is, okay, suppose we want to develop a nano tech cluster in the north, or maybe a biotech cluster around Porto, and why not a wind cluster around Lisbon, or a solar cluster around Belgia? And the question that we always have when we think about this, in any of the situations, of course we would like to have a nano tech cluster centered around the north. In fact, we have now a nano um, institute together with the Spanish that could maybe as well be an embryo for something like that. But the question we always have is how do you establish a growing new high tech industry? And what factors influence firm success? That's the kind of thing that we would really like to know. And the point is that there are a lot of times, a lot of misguided, untrue ideas about what's really behind the development of a new high tech industry. And one of the things that we talk about is that, well, Portugal, can we really develop a high-tech hub in Portugal? Come on. We're just too small. It will never happen, right? You know, if you compare Portugal with the U.S., which is the market that I know well, look at that. You know, we're so small compared to the U.S. It's just not the same. We can't do anything about that, right? I mean, okay, maybe where for the U.S. is very big, it has a large, uh, you know, country, but if you look at population, which is the market the same, right? I mean, this is a, ma a map that represents the wealthy population of Portugal and a bunch of other countries with the U.S., and they say the same thing. It's so small. What we sometimes forget is, what is this thing about small? Because, in fact, we spend a lot of time talking about a very, very small sp space of the United States. So, let's think about the north of Portugal. Right? And let's think that we want to develop, say, a cluster in that region of uh, Miu and Porto, that area there. That area there is even smaller than Portugal, right? I and mean, we think that Portugal is small, right? It is even much smaller than Portugal. It's actually, you know, around 3,000 square kilometers. So it's tiny compared to the global world. But it's actually going to see the area because of something that I'm about to show you. So 3,000 square meters. Well, other region of the world has around 3,000 square meters that we may care about, that we've actually heard about, and that we've actually maybe spend a lot of time talking about. So, there's this very tiny county called the Santa Clara County, which has around 3,000 square kilometers, around the same type, size of Porto and Nino. It's a size we're pretty familiar with. And this, this county, which sits in the middle of California, it's a tiny area of California. In fact, it represents about, you know, 0.8% of California, which in itself represents about 4% of the U.S. So it's a really, really tiny place. Another very interesting thing about this very tiny place is that in 1950, it had 300,000 people. It was this very, very small region and very undeveloped with a few exceptions, a few universities. What is this amazing reason we talk about? We're talking about Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is about the size of Minu and Porto. That's the size of Silicon Valley, right? That's one of the most well-known tech clusters of the world. And one of the interesting things is that in today we say, oh, Silicon Valley, nothing is like Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is so different. We can never have Silicon Valley. It turns out that in 1950, there was no Silicon Valley. There was almost nothing. There was pasture. Where did it all start? It started pretty much 
in the beginning with something very interesting, which is the semiconductor industry. The semiconductor industry, starting in the 1950s, was the beginning of Silicon Valley. Until then, there was no tech hub industry in Silicon Valley. There was nothing. There was not much in Silicon Valley. And the interesting thing is that the seed to create Silicon Valley was not originally from Silicon Valley, which is a very interesting thing about that. So let's think about that, right? Let's take a step back and think about Silicon Valley. One of the things is that we think about Silicon Valley because it's a historical incubator. We have, you know, Packard and that brothers late in the world there. The other two things that are important about Silicon Valley, the way we think about it, the conceptions we have about this area, is that it's famous for its informal environment of informal exchange. Everybody talks about everything in the new text, what's happening, what's not happening. It's also very well known. In fact, on the informal exchange, everybody says that the 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 Warren Hall um, called uh, the Warren Hill, which I represent here, was basically where most of the deals of the semiconductor industry were, pre- were done. In this very interesting non-high tech bar that you see here uh, on the 50s. The other thing that's very really well known is the mobility across uh, uh, across uh, institutions. People are always moving around from one place to the other. And that is important because that configures what we think is important in the cluster. People find out about what is the latest technology, they understand what's the new things, and because of that, they can learn about it, they can move into that, they can be on the cutting edge, and that's what drives performance, that's what makes being a cluster so important. That's why we think it's important to create clusters, right? So if we go back and we think about the semiconductor industry, and we think about, so what was the frontier knowledge in semiconductor industry that's interesting for us to understand where it comes from? And the interesting thing about that is the beginning of the industry was grouped in three types of technologies, monolithic, hybrid, and film. Three types of semiconductor uh, technologies. Why is this interesting? Because at the beginning, we didn't know which of these technologies was going to be dominant. It turns out that we know later that monolithic IC production and monolithic ICs were the dominant force. They're behind the memories, the ASICs, the chips, everything you have now in your computer, it's basically monolithic integrated circuit production. But we didn't know about that. And all the firms that made it to the top printer were monolithic IC producers. So, if we think about that, we would think, okay, well, maybe Silicon Valley then must be at the forefront of this monolithic IC production because it was a frontier. More interesting than that, the firms that maybe didn't start at the frontier because they were kind of experimenting, they moved to the frontier because they heard about the frontier. They knew that the frontier was monolithic IC production. And in fact, with the evolution, you see that the beginning monolithic was not quite the dominant technology, and then over time, you put that and became quite dominant in terms of what's actually happening in the, in the integrated circuit uh, world. And so again, this idea is that, okay, then so can is to dominate, right? Now, the interesting thing is when we start to look at history and what was happening at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the industry, we may think that there was not quite, the story is not quite right. And that's the part that's interesting for us when we think about a tech hub development strategy. So the thing we have here in this graph is the evolution of the semiconductor industry in the United States. You see, we have the number of firms. Obviously, it was a fast-growing industry. It started in the 50s, basically. And so very fast-growing industry. I only have here the beginning of the industry because that's the part that, I, that I'm interested in studying. But if it was growing, if it moved beyond the 80s, we will still go for, further beyond what we have here. The interesting thing you have about here is what I told you. The beginning of the industry, Silicon Valley, is actually tiny compared to the others. And if we project this back, we don't have that correct data, but if we project this back to 1955, we also know one thing, that, that, some, that Silicon Valley has zero percent of integrated circuit production, and nothing, or zero. And the interesting thing as well is that reached 1980, it had 50% of the market. So we're talking about 25 years, it went from nothing to being the leader in integrated circuit production. But the other thing you also think is, well, wow, then why Silicon Valley? Look at this. Boston, LA, New York, they were much more developed courses, they had much more things. So why not in Boston? Why not in LA? Why not in New York? They were much bigger. They were much more interesting. There were much more activity going on. What they do not have, right, is one particular person. And that person makes a, 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 a difference because it turns out, as I will show, that that idea that we have about the exchange, about finding what, what, what's happening, what, uh, what's, what's the latest trend, may not be as important as you think so. And what made a difference is not it's a person. It's not just any person. It's a very important person. And I'll tell you that in a minute. If you look at what you see, is the number of entrants. 
And you see that Silicon Valley, in fact, had most of the firms starting in monolithic integrated state of production, 92% of the firms, which is much higher than what was happening on all the other, on all the other regions. And that's what was started to be behind its success. They were all starting in the frontier technology, much more than anywhere else. Moreover, if you look at the firms that did not start in the frontier technology, and ask them, okay, they were in Silicon Valley, or they were in Boston, they found out about, you know, what is the latest technology, so they learned about it and moved into monolithic IC. Very small percentage, about 15% throughout. Moreover, if you're outside a cluster, you don't change it anyway compared to if you're in a cluster. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. You need to start at the frontier, or you never get there. And in fact, none of the firms that ever changed made it to top 20 firms. All the firms that made it to top 20 in the integrated circuit production basically started at monolithic IC production. And what was behind all that? One person, William Shockley. Not just any person, a model award winner person. This person invented the transistor. He also invented the bipolar junction that's behind the creation of the integrated circuit. And why it was so important? Well, he worked in Dallas for a long time, but in 1955, he moved to California. He started chocolate laboratories that started to commercialize the first transistor. And what happened that was very interesting is that Chocolate semiconductors didn't go, very, didn't go very far. Why? Because William Chocolate was an amazing physicist. He was also a very lousy manager. So he attracted tremendous talent to work with them. Five years later, they all gone and created their own companies doing the technology that he was doing. Why? Because California has a very interesting peculiarity, which is if I work in semiconductors and I'm fed up with you and I leave, I can found or choose to affirm that that's something that was the next day because there are no complete agreements. There is no such thing as writing a contract saying you cannot work for the competition or you cannot start the competition. You cannot enforce that in California. So that's exactly what happened. So in fact, if you look at the early semiconductor leaders, you saw child, which was the first one that was founded after Shockley, coming out of Shockley. You also see Texas Instruments, which was the other inventor of the, of the, of the, of the integrated circuit. And then you look at the later top 10 leaders. What did you see about them? Oh, they were in the cluster that was so good, they learned a lot. No. They all descend pretty much from the founding firms. You look at where they came from? Genetics. Somebody left their child to create genetics. Emma or National. Somebody left their child to create National. Look at Mostek. Somebody left their child to create to create Mostek. So the underlying force that's related to this is the spin-off process. It's not being in a cluster. It's all about heritage. It's where you start. It's what you're endowed with at the beginning. It's the knowledge, the ambition, the drive that you have to make something really different. So one person can make a different one seed, which in this case was really chocolate. It's not just any person. It was a very, very smart person that had a lot of knowledge. And then the process just goes by itself because people are entrepreneurs and just people just go and do it. And that's what made a fantastic difference. So what's very interesting is that firms in Silicon Valley were much more likely to be at the frontier, which was monologic IC, and to be the leaders. But what's interesting about those firms is that they were at the frontier, not because they were in Silicon Valley per se, in the sense that they learned. In fact, one of the firms that were in the cluster that learned about this frontier were ever able to move successfully to the frontier to be a leading firm. What matters is when you start and the underlying knowledge with which you're endowed to start that really makes a difference to you. So why do we care about those? Because first, clusters, as we think about it, from this idea of putting firms together because we learn about this, about the trial, may be a very limited value. There's not much you can actually probably gain with that. It's the top firms that are really from the inception. They don't need anybody else around them to learn about and then move to the frontier. Either they are or they're not. And that pretty much almost starts from the beginning. The other thing that's very interesting is one star firm, not any firm, not the average firm, but a star firm can actually change the underlying industrial structure of the whole region. And that's extremely powerful. It's powerful for Portugal, it's powerful for any region. But it's not just doing the average thing, it's doing something completely different, completely new, and very, very ambitious that can have that power. It's not just anything. 
And one of the things that then the process will follow to clusters, to spin offs that happen and that just basically leave and create its own value. And you can think, okay, well, I'm telling you a story about something that's rather well, but that was one case. It turns out the more you study this phenomenon, the more you study tends to be the same we find in any other region. So I told you about something that in the, in the U.S., which is a high tech industry. Same thing happened even before that with Detroit. Why is it that Detroit started in the automotive industry? Exactly the same process. You look at the labor and the hard drive industries. Exactly the same process. Look at one of the few firm industries that we have created from zero that became internationally successful competitors. The mold making industry in Portugal, exactly the same process. You can trace it back to the Emilio Gabranch firm from where it all started. The first firm, and then people left, created their own firms, and that's what's behind the mold making industry cluster in Portugal. The garment industry in Bangladesh, and many other industries. The process is always repeats itself, right? So, why do we care? We care because one or a few entrepreneurs can create a radical difference environment in a particular region and change the industrial landscape of a region. And that's very easy for a small region like Portugal. Success doesn't necessarily need favorable environment. There's nothing about regions of competitiveness or anything. What really matters is the difference, is the fact that the leading entrepreneurs are doing something that's different. They're not just doing the average. And basically, in small markets, every time you say that, they're basically looking at the global, at the global scale. They're looking international. They're not just trying to do the average, the same thing that everybody else around them is trying, is trying to do. And we need, we need a lot of trial and error. We don't know what's going to work. We need a lot of trials. We need incentives to basically try something. So if we go back to this idea of developing a tech hub in Portugal, what do we need? What do we learn from these kinds of, of studies, from these kinds of approaches? We learn actually quite interesting things about what we may want to consider. One of the things is certainly about a strong investment in all generations and top talent. All these differences, the people that made a difference, they're top talent. Top talent doesn't necessarily mean that it's a PhD, but they're a very, very talented person. They're not definitely your average person. Now, the universities are a very important source to create scientific excellence, but it's not your average university that you have typically in Portugal, where the funding is ever is is equal to everybody and you don't get, get anything from, from that, is really basically a different kind of university that may, may make a difference. And we really want to support both the public and the private for excellent and global achievement ideas. Don't fund your average firm. It's not going to get you anywhere. You may get some money, a little money. It's not going to change the industrial landscape of a country. So if you want to change the industrial landscape of, of a country, that's on, on ideas and projects that really have the right ambition and drive. They may fail, but all it takes is one to succeed. Test for mobility. non compete covenants. Don't allow people to go and create things that compete with what you do. And another thing is allow for trial and error. And that in Portugal makes sense. One important thing is limiting the responsibility of the founders if they fail and streamline the banks of seed law so that you can do that. And the very important thing as well is keep talent coming. Facilitate the entry of talent to Portugal, which is a very difficult thing to do nowadays. I've tried to bring people to Portugal. It's extremely difficult. So, thank you very much.